Hey guys, it's Jane and today I will be painting this eye study with you. I'm gonna show you a footage of how I created this painting very shortly. There were some requests about how to mix skin colors and so I thought I will use this opportunity since I already will be using a lot of these skin tones and we'll show you how to mix skin tones very briefly this is not like a very in-depth video but you, you you're gonna get the info from this video about how to create skin tones from owning just a very few paints and so the paints that we are going to be using is uh, raw sienna alzarin crimson we will also need van dyke brown this will be like the first three very important colors and i'm also gonna use neutral tint and then very important for me is a cerulean blue and you probably have ultramarine blue because because that's oftentimes contained in any beginner's palettes if you have a ultramarine blue and you have van dyke brown or any other type of brown that is dark enough then you can mix these two into something very similar to neutral tint and in that case you won't need neutral tint so these are the colors that you need you don't need all of them you definitely need these two and some kind of blue at least and i would recommend the brown as well and we'll get to the mixing how to mix the basic skin tone grab a bit of the raw sienna a bit of the other crimson you mix it up and you add water don't uh, forget about that because i often get that uh, people mix when try to mix colors they their mix is very thick like when you're working with gouache for example they don't give it enough water so the paint can't really shine because these are transparent pigments if you apply them to paper then it will cause these two paints and the mix to merge with the white of the paper visually and this is the final color it's it's also the reason why we use white palettes for mixing so that we can see and why is it important to use transparent pigments well you you don't have to use transparent pigments but it depends on what's the type of technique that you are going for with your watercolors for example i if i want to do something more detailed such as the eye then i'm gonna do more layers i'm gonna apply layer after layer and i need transparent watercolor for that because opaque watercolor will cover everything and will cover the white underneath and so the illusion is a bit uh, different than when you use transparent watercolors sometimes i don't use transparent watercolors if i do illustrations and i want to have a face finished within two or three layers in that case i prefer the pre-mixed naples yellow reddish that i already showed you in my art supplies haul video and this is a opaque paint it contains a white pigment want me to show it to you <laughs> and compare these two see it is very different and you can see that this has other than the consistency it uh, it definitely covers up a lot of the paper and the visual effect is very different and if i was to do my layering technique using this kind of paint uh, with the white pigment in it then one of my layers would cover all my previous layers and the visual effect that i'm going for with the layering would not be so visible I hope this makes sense when you're mixing your own skin tones but you can make them a more rosy something like this you can also mix in a little more uh, raw sienna to create a different and more yellowish kind of skin tone so what i love about mixing is that you can really play with the amount of uh, particular pigment and make it your own the trouble with it is also that you need to mix enough so that it covers the whole painting and you don't run out of the pre-mixed paint before you are finished because chances are that you won't be able to mix the same skin tone anymore let's see if we could mix something similar to the pre-mixed skin tone using white 
I don't have white watercolor at hand at the moment. I have white gouache. Let's grab some sienna and crimson, mix it together. Like this would have been the version. It still contains too much sienna. Now it's the other way around. Let's try to mix in some white, just a little bit. Okay, we're, see, we're getting closer to the pre-mixed skin tone. It will need a bit more sienna. And now a bit more crimson, maybe a bit more white. And we will be there soon. We're getting there. We're still a bit more on the rosier side, but an exercise such as this one will certainly give you something. See, we're almost there. So it works like this. When you buy a premixed skin tone, you have to know that it contains the white pigment and that it will make your paint automatically a little more opaque than mixing it your own. So if you are going for the layering technique, uh, such as I will present in this video, then you should try these two paints and really look for the transparent versions. We know now how to mix the basic skin tone. Now let's discuss how to create much darker and deeper skin tones. Well, mm, I always mix both of these colors, the yellows and the reds together as a basis for darker skin tones and then mix the Van Dyke Brown into the pre-mixed paint. And here are much darker skin tones that will always contain the, the basis. The more Van Dyke Brown you add, the, the deeper and the darker the skin tone will be. Uh, for darkening these further, you can use neutral tint, which is a very good color and is very useful. Neutral tint is not warm nor cool color. It is very suitable for darkening. So let's mix the neutral tint into the combo that we just mixed and let's see how dark it gets. It is very dark and it looks really nice. The problem with watercolor is that it fades away when it dries, so while it is okay and you have no problem if you paint like porcelain skin, but if you go for darker skin tones, then it might be an issue and the neutral tint might really come in handy. So I really like the range that these four colors can create and you really don't need anything else. By the way, neutral tint is usually not something that is included in basic packs, but what they do have, maybe you notice, but they don't have black as well. Black is not really suitable for darkening colors because the final result is usually very muddy. It doesn't look as nice as when you use, for example, neutral tint. But what you can do is to mix your own version of neutral tint by using the dark brown and one color that you do have on your palette and that is ultramarine blue. Let's see what happens. You probably have ultramarine blue. It's like the basic blue that you have on every beginner's palette. And let's mix it up a bit of the Van Dyke brown. Now I'm trying to, when mixing, I'm trying to find the middle. It's not 50-50. I'm trying to just see if the final result is not too blue, but not too brown either. And the resulting color looks like this. It is a version, it is a very good version of black. By the way, you can also mix in the third color, which is alizarin crimson, to get even closer to the neutral tint that I use, for example, from Daniel Smith. So let's try that. It's a three combination, but it works nicely. It is much warmer now. To conclude, if you have ultramarine blue and you have Van Dyke Brown, that's all that you need to create something similar that neutral tint. And this paint could now be used in combination with, with this basis for flesh tones and to create darker ones. So here is the full range of skin tones that you can use 
in your paintings with using basically just these four paints. If you have neutral tint, then it's a shortcut. You don't have to mix these two or these three. And if you have a pre-mixed skin tone, we discussed that, uh, you can just easily create it by combining these two and adding a bit of white in case you need it to be more opaque or just leave the white out in case you want the skin tone to be more transparent. To create shadows, everything that you paint in shadow, the color appears to be colder. So you will need to mix the bases with something of a colder color. For example, you can mix in ultramarine blue into the basic mix. You can mix in neutral tint, but you can also use greens. They're great, for example, olive green uh, to darken up the, the mix and use that for shadows. In my painting of an eye that I will be doing today, I use the cerulean blue, uh, mixed it up into the basic flesh tone to create shadows because shadows on my reference photo appear to be more on the bluish side, but sometimes they appear to be more green but it is never like I grab a cerulean blue and paint shadows with them. I always need to include this paint into the basic mix and that's how I get the final color that is in the shadow. All right, and with, with all this in mind, let's try to play with these and paint an eye. I created a sketch on a regular scrap piece of paper and then transferred it onto my Arches 300 GSM cold pressed watercolor paper using a window. I didn't have a light table at hand at home. The dimensions of this painting are about 25 by 25 centimeters. And then I started with the first layer of paint, which was basic skin tone and I used a lot of wet in wet. I really like to create watercolor effects, especially for the basis of my painting. And then again, as a last layer to add some splatter, some visual interests. That is why I use a lot of extra drops of clean water that I just let run into the first wet wash. After I let the first wash dry naturally, it creates these nice splatters that I use for the basis. You don't have to do that, by the way, if you do an eye study, you're perfectly fine just smoothening out the edges. I then moved onto the eyeball, which is actually not white. It is more like a grayish color with all the other colors of the skin sort of reflected. Normally I just used like a scrap gray color that is a leftover on my palette with lots of water to create a transparent grayish film. But if you have a clean palette, a new one, and you need to know how to mix it, there is always some skin tone present in it. But also just add a cerulean blue, ultramarine blue or a bit of purple and you'll get there. Just don't forget to use it in a very, very light and transparent wash. It is probably a good idea to use a good reference picture uh, if you are painting a detailed study of anything. But with the eye, what I like the most is that every eye is different and then you can try different approach, especially on the iris that is always a trial and error. There is never one proper way how to paint the iris. There are some principles that you should stick to if you want the iris to look alive such as the bottom part should be much lighter because it gets more light than the upper part that is in shadow from eyelashes. By the way, I took the reference picture myself and it is of the eye of my 11 years old daughter and the light source is basically coming from the left and that affected all the shadows that I placed on this eye. So make sure that if you are painting an eye study, you don't exactly follow one or the other tutorial. You just check where the shadows are, particularly in the reference that you are painting and just try to apply the proper color and mix it just like we discussed in the first part. I mentioned that my work on the iris is always trial and error and I painted a lot of eye studies in the past and never did I paint iris the same way or followed any kind of 
rule or specific approach that I would recommend to you is just observe the reference and try to mimic it in a painting. Other than the paints that we discussed in the first part, I used one specific paint. I already talked about it in my art supplies video haul and it is Porter's Pink. I own one by Schminky and one by Daniel Smith, so this particular one is by Schminky, which is a bit darker than the Daniel Smith one. And I just uh, used a very thin wash of uh, Potter's Pink just to add a bit of the texture. And since this is a close-up, I thought it would help me to get some of the skin pores there. Cerulean blue that I use by Daniel Smith also granulates, especially when I mix it with the base for the flesh tone. And that also helped me to get some of the pores there. Normally, I wouldn't use a granulating paint for any kind of face if I work on an illustration that just features a portrait that one wouldn't have as many details on the eyes but since this is a close-up so it's I'm painting a really large eye then in that case I would do it because uh, yeah the skin isn't really smooth when you look very closely my layering technique helps me to deepen the shadows continuously and I kind of fight a watercolor tendency to lighten up after it dries. Every time that I dry up a wash I just uh, observe the final result and try to figure out if it's dark enough already and if it isn't I'll just add another layer. This is what the transparent watercolor is really great at. This technique is really excellent and you have good control over what you are creating with watercolor because there is not as much water on the paper at once but you need to just have patience because it takes a long time to finish and it's good to have a hair dryer or some kind of tool that would help you to dry your layers quickly at hand. I found a reliable brush that I don't, it doesn't have any brand, it's just a cheap, very thin brush with stiff and very bad quality bristles that I used to draw with my paint, the, the tiny details such as veins. If you are drawing veins on your eye study, just make sure that they are not insanely red. Just a hint of uh, alizarin crimson will do the trick so that the eye doesn't look like it didn't sleep for 48 hours. Probably the hardest part is always drawing lashes or eyebrows. With lashes I have a strategy, I always try to draw them first in light paint. They grow in groups but they have a general direction to them. So it is a mistake and it looks weird if they are too short or if they are too long. So just draw them lightly, draw a couple of them, uh, try to figure out how long they are and then you will get darker paint and you will go over the ones that were successful. Phew, the last part is here and those are the white highlights that are so incredibly satisfying to draw or paint. I use white gouache. I think that that's the perfect uh, white, opaque white to combine with watercolor. I might talk about it in another video and I just draw them where I see them in my reference. You can also design the highlights, you don't have to mindlessly copy or whatever reflection you have on your randomly taken reference. And that's what I try to do, maybe I overworked it, that's up to you to judge maybe. <laughs> Here comes the point when whatever I add will just make the painting look more cluttered, so it's a good idea to maybe just quit. After I'm done with painting, usually I take a picture of it on my phone and then transfer it to my Mac and see on the screen. It is more objective for me to see if there are still any mistakes, if the color values are okay. And if I'm not happy, I will maybe add something that is missing. And if I'm happy, then I will just take a picture and I'm done. I want to thank you guys for watching. And I also want to ask you if you enjoyed this tiny little watercolor lesson. If you did, let me know in the comments and give me a thumbs up, that always helps the video. And I'm taking requests if you have something specific that you would like me to make a video about. Turns out that your suggestions are very helpful to the rest of the people that watch these videos. And with that, have a great weekend. I'll see you next week, hopefully. Bye bye.